yeah, growing up, coaches were always just like, you need to get more forward. You need to get more forward. And we do all these drills where you're just like moving your hips forward and leaning on the front of your boots and like getting your shoulders over your tips and all this stuff. And then as I kind of got older and was making, you know, more nuanced turns on harder slopes, um, it just wasn't clicking. And I realized that like, you can't be forward all the time. And that's actually a really slow way to ski. And so I'm like, I'm not saying you need to get off the front of your boots. Actually, you kind of have. Hey skiers, welcome to another episode of the Big Picture Skiing Podcast. On today's show, you're gonna meet Jimmy Krupka. Now, Jimmy is a member of the US ski team and he's got his sights set on becoming North American champion this season. So uh, watch closely, that'll be really interesting. I think this guy's definitely got it in him. I really love the way he, he thinks about skiing. He's definitely a thinker, but he's also very good at putting that aside and knowing that good skiing actually happens by kind of running on feel and, and on instinct. You'll hear some insights into what Jimmy thinks about ski boots and skis. There's some really interesting stuff, especially around uh, the faster speed skis. You'll also hear Jimmy's main drills he thought really helped him become a very fundamentally solid ski racer at an early age where he came from his uh his history it's really really interesting he's he's a funny guy so i think it's uh he's very easy to listen to very articulate and uh i hope you enjoy this episode i think there's a ton in it and afterwards please follow him on instagram at jimmy underscore who underscore he's uh, got a very entertaining channel a quick mention for my website, Big Picture Skiing, and soon to be an app for iOS and Android. It's where I put all my ideas and my co-coach Sam puts his thoughts in there too on skiing technique, equipment setup, we teach lessons on bumps, uh, theory on racing, all sorts of stuff. It's The goal is to be a one-stop shop, be one of the best resources out there for skiers to find out about how to improve their skiing. So if you haven't checked it out, bigpictureskiing.com and soon to be found on the Google Play and Apple App Store. Now, without further ado, let's get in and hear from the guy you've been wanting to hear from, Jimmy Krupka or Jimmy who? Jimmy, thanks very much for joining us on the Big Picture Skiing podcast. I'm going to hit you with uh, my first question here. Why are you not the world's best slalom skier right now? What's what's holding you back? Or are you just on this trajectory and we're just waiting to see you be world number one? So there are days where I feel amazing and I feel like I could beat anyone, um, but that's not the truth. Um, and I like to kind of stay grounded in reality. I've got a lot of work to do. Um, basically, my my flat skiing feels almost as fast as anyone. Um, like really, flip, really flat stuff. Um, I'm working on maintaining and generating speed on kind of moderate terrain where there can a huge gap can open up between the best guys and the worst guys. So I'm just trying to figure out how to, you know, keep my skis on the ground and keep generating speed through that stuff. Um, and that's really like my big, um, like that would be a main, uh, like a main focus in this yeah. season is like, you want to be able to see in like those kind of sections of a course you're better than, than you were last year and yeah yeah and to, so, so to figure that out do you do you like using video like do you watch people that you know are good at that and then compare to what your line and movements are or what do you or do you just like to get out there and train that terrain and feel it like what's your style i think the best way to get better at something is just to do it and and just um keep an open mind and stay curious and just work really hard and get a lot of reps in. I think that's kind of my, been my sort of, um, formula for getting better. Um, obviously you got to look at video and you got to look at what, what the other guys are doing. Um, and, and more than anything, um, just look at what they're accomplishing with their skis, because it's easy to look at the best skiers in the world and go, Oh, I'll just copy exactly what they're doing. I'll try to put my hands the way they're doing it. I'll try to do my knees the same way. And that's a really misleading thing to do because you don't, you don't ski like those guys, you have your own style and um, what they're accomplishing on the snow is all pretty similar to each other though. Yeah. So how, so then have you got a little like simple cue now of fear feeling, you know, that you're getting that speed in that into like those sort of not flats, but the intermediate kind of parts of the run. 
yeah, how do you get yourself in the right position to, to do that? Or what's, or what's the mistake, you know, oh no, that, that's the thing that makes me slower. Like, do you know what that is? Yeah. Um, I mean, what those guys, what the best in the world do really well is um, they pick the ski up or I say pick the ski up. It's actually the opposite. They press the ski into the snow early. So they're basically maybe just, it's maybe one foot before me, but their ski is pressed into the snow and arcing down into the apex. Whereas maybe my ski um, is sliding a little bit and then hitting their arc and pressuring just before the apex. Um, but you know, the early pressure sort of thing is, is key. There, there's so much to it though. I mean, if you really want to break it down, there's like, you, you need to go deep. So you, you have to kind of have your skis pointed out so that they can snap back. Cause if your skis are kind of just pointed down the hill the whole time, then they don't, they're not able to create that, that snap, or like really bending the ski. Um, they're not, they're also not able to, you're not able to cut off as much line if you're not going deep like that. So people love to talk about this concept of going deep, <clears throat> basically where your skis are pointed out. Um, the opposite the way to where you want to go. Yes. Almost the top of the turn. And then you kind of step yeah. back. Um, yeah. And I love to geek out about this stuff as much as anyone. Um, but at the end of the day, um, generally like the way I'm trying to get better at this is just like, <clears throat> feel it out. Like I feel, I just like get, give the feedback that turn felt good. Let me try to make more of those. So is it almost like, like I know whenever I try and not to level you or your uh, teammates do it at, but I know when I try and do that, it's almost like you have to do anti-turning. Like you have to tell yourself, just don't try and turn. <laughs> Would you yeah. kind of, a, is that almost what you, cause you, especially as it gets steeper, you want to be a bit of a wuss and you kind of want to, you know, like feel yeah. a bit of the snow through a brushing skidding. And it's like, don't do that. Just yeah. don't like, would you, would you agree? It's really, yeah. It's really hard to force yourself to, you know, quote unquote, go deep in the turn because when you're going fast, you're on a pitch and you finish a turn. The first thing you want to do is, is kind of push the tails of your skis out. So you're kind of ready to come back the other direction. And so trusting yourself like that's a big word we use when we're working on this kind of thing is like trusting yourself to finish your turn and just kind of float down the fall line for a second and then push that ski into the ground um keep still pointed out and then uh kind of bend the ski back into the fall line um it's it's hard to trust yourself to do that yeah yeah totally okay so if we we wind back like the clock on your life in a little bit like what's what's your background like how how did you get into you know racing uh being on the u.s ski team um started skiing at two my parents were big skiers um my middle name is cannon after cannon mountain um which is you know new hampshire um and then they weren't racers really my mom you know raced a couple of races in high school but they weren't really planning for me to race necessarily um but I, uh, I don't, I think it was like, I saw a poster of Bodie Miller somewhere and I was like, what is he doing? And that's what I want to do. Um, my parents were like, Oh, that's ski racing. I was like, put me in the club, put me in the, put me in the ski club right now. Um, so kind of from age like five or six, I was totally hooked on the idea of ski racing and, and going to the world cup circuit and being on the U S ski team. Um, and so flash forward, you know, seventh grade, we moved to Vermont so I could attend the ski academy in Waitsfield, uh, Green Mountain Valley School. Um, and then from there, when I graduated high school, I made the, you know, development team. Um, and I've kind of just slowly been working my way up there ever since. As, as like, uh, I'm a dad, I've got a five-year-old. Like, do you have really good memories of going to a school that was a, like a school that was focused on skiing? Yes. I, I like, <laughs> I loved my high school experience. There's a lot of people that like, were like, Oh, high school was tough. Um, I loved high school and because I got to ski every day. I mean, it's no surprise there. What like literally during the skiing? winter, like every day, every single oh, day, like so good. We, well, except for Mondays, Mondays was a full class day. Um, it was like class from, you know, 8am to 6pm. Um, but then 
you know, every other day class started after lunch and went to 6 p.m. So you just skied all morning, um, you know, those four weekdays and obviously you'd ski on the weekends. Did you find, were you the kind of uh, person that, were you a bit of a naughty kid? Were you a, were you a good, like you did all the stuff that coaches would say, or would you be off building jumps with your, your friends in the trees? And uh, it, it was kind of a mixture. It was like, okay. I inherently, I was kind of a goody two shoes. And so I listened to what the coaches said and I, and I like, like, you know, quote unquote, like worked hard. Um, but I will say that like the, 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 the rules I would break were, were safety rules. So it was like, we would, we would build a jump where we weren't supposed to, or in the off season, like we'd, we'd put up a slack line, like 40 feet in the trees across some ravine behind the school. That was the stuff that would get me in trouble. So then for like people that are maybe, you know, not the level of, of, of ski racing, but we wind back to like, what helped you get there? I was asking just before the show, like, did you have some favorite ski drills that you felt were like really effective for you to get like fundamentals down? Yes. Um, one of them, I remember there was a year I had a really tough season after, I think it was ninth grade. I had a really tough um, ski season. Um, wasn't putting in a ton of effort. I was eating microwave popcorn for breakfast. I was the games so like that kind of thing. And the results showed. And so like that summer in the prep period, I was like, okay, I've got to buckle down and, I don't know what inspired me to do this, but someone had told me like one skiing is really good for you. So like literally every day during our, during the summer and fall at our prep camps, I like after training had ended, I'd go out for like five to 10 extra runs on one ski. Um, and number one, it like builds strength, obviously. And I was like on a pommel lift too. So I was on this like one leg the whole time dying. It was terrible. But like being able to balance on one ski and make turns is like exponentially increases your abilities. I think your skill. Yeah. All skills, right? Yeah. Like, like every, yeah. The edging, your balance, like where you point the ski and steer it. Like, yeah, that's, that's interesting. You know, that's one of um, Shlopey's Eric Shlopey's go-tos. Oh, really? yeah. yeah. Early season heaps of that and same with my uh my sort of co-coach sam who he, he he raced a couple of world championships in super g he grew up ski racing in australia and that was one of the things in australia we get a lot of like wind hold and bad days and so the the ski racing club was always on like the beginner hill on those days when all these kids are on one ski like crashing and practicing and going but yeah it, it's such a good like fundamental isn't it and um yeah. kind of takes away from always like just outside ski outside ski like you got to learn to to master like skiing the inside ski as well because that's yeah, the hard yeah. part yeah you're so you're developing not only that skill but all of those muscles that kind of hold you in place when you're on your inside ski because sometimes mm -hmm. you end up on your inside ski or whatever um and also like it gives you instant feedback like the instant your hips are a little bit too far back, like you can't even hold it up and you fall. For my fascination with being forward all the time started. I think we talked about that before the show, but that's yeah. Do you do you want to do you want to speak to that? Because I know in one of your uh, just just so people know, you have a podcast called Arc City, and it's a really cool podcast, and I recommend people listen to that. But in one of them, you uh, you were speaking with uh, Sam Deprat, yeah, about about always being forward. Yeah. So do you want to speak to, I guess you, when you discovered it's not always being forward and your thoughts on being forward? Yeah. Yeah. I know. Like, like, yeah. Growing up coaches were always just like, you need to get more forward. You need to get more forward. And we do all these drills where you're just like moving your hips forward and leaning on the front of your boots and like getting your shoulders over your tips and all this stuff. Um, <clears throat> and I did this one skiing stuff too. And I was like, the secret to skiing is being forward all the time. Um, and then as I kind of got older and was making, you know, more nuanced turns on harder slopes, um, it just wasn't clicking. And I realized that like, you can't be forward all the time. And that's actually a really slow way to ski. Um, and so I'm like, I'm not saying you need to get off the front of your boots. Actually, if you kind of have a little cock to your shins, if you're like at all times, that's good, but you can't be 
leaning over the front of your tips at all times. Um, there, there's kind of, um, there's a rocking motion. And uh, yeah, we talked about this for the show where I was saying like the, the water skiing is a perfect way to look at it. Cause you see a water skier and they kind of come into their turn, you know, middle of the ski, maybe forward even. And then as they round the buoy, they lean back like crazy. And so they're using their ski like tip to tail in this rocking motion. Um, and that's the way, like, you know, to, you know, for all intents and purposes, that's the way that a GS turn, a slalom turn should be. It should be like, you kind of start, you watch Marco Odermatt, best GS skier in the world right now. He is crazy forward at the front of the turn, at the top of the turn. And as he comes through the, the apex and completion of the turn, he's kind of rocking back on his tail a little bit. So his whole ski is bending tip to tail. It stays in contact with the snow. It's just a more natural and power generating arc. Did you figure that out through like chatting with friends, like feeling it yourself? Like what was the discovery? Um, I think it was, it was just like training, training one day on, on tough conditions and my tails kept washing out. Um, we were on kind of like Bali snow and, um, you need kind of more touch to your skiing, more nuance when you're on tough snow like that, inconsistent snow. And, I, and like, I couldn't figure it out. And my coach and one of my teammates, this is what, this is why like a good teammate is great. Who will point things out for you. He's like, dude, you're, you're way too far forward. Your tails are washing out because you're leaning on the front of your ski. And so your tail has no pressure in the snow. Um, and that was like a huge aha moment for me. Um, and I've been kind of, you know, I've kind of figured that out since. Yeah, cool. So, you, so, you, so one of your favorite, like, or drills that you really felt helped level you up as the one ski, would you say there are any other like good ones for fundamentals of, of good ski technique? Yeah. The, the other one that I love is the, um, the people call it the uh, up and over drill. Some people don't like that. They call it the through and over. Basically what you're doing is you're crossing the hill um on your downhill ski with your uphill ski in the air and then while you're still crossing the hill you switch to your uphill ski balance on it and then make a turn while like just on that ski so that uphill ski becomes your new downhill ski throughout that arc um so it's almost like one ski skiing because you always have one foot in the air um but what it does for you is it just like shows you how to be balanced on the outside ski because some people um or, or sometimes i'll just get in the habit of just not really being in the outside ski and it's possibly one of the most important things in skiing i'll just go okay downhill ski outside ski and things start to clean themselves up um but the beauty of this drill is that it also teaches you and also kind of primes you to get that pressure we were talking about get that deep early pressure kind of it's basically your uphill ski and then it turns into your downhill ski and you're pushing into the fall line and um i love that drill yeah that would be i, I say like i'd say a great one to stop people doing a little pivot right balance yeah. move with the new arc with balance instead of trying to like yeah. cut off or, or brush the top of the turn a little bit okay nice would there be a third um i'm not sure i mean I, I think that um, if it comes to, if, if you're working on technique, there's a million you can do. Um, it's always fun to get rid of your poles or to try to balance something in your hands just to keep that, keep that core and upper body disassociated from the lower body. But I'm also a huge believer in what people call constraint courses. So I had this, I think probably the best coach I've, I've had, um, Sasha Rierich, who used to coach the U.S. team. Now he's in France at some academy. Um but he would just set crazy courses. He'd set, you know, 15 meter super across the hill slaloms with stubbies in between. Um, he would set like 15 or like 12 meter straight down the hill slalom. So you're, you're going like Mach 10 in slalom, which is scary, but it's good for you. Like he'd do all these different things. So you don't have to think about your technique. You just have to survive the course and ski the course well. And if you ski the course, well, you're improving your skiing. Yeah, I love that. That constraints-based learning is is really cool. I think in all sports. I said Sasha was the best coach I've had. I've had a lot of good coaches. So if any of my coaches are listening, <laughs> um, Sasha was the best coach for me that year. Like I improved immensely that year. 
Um, but I just want to shout out my other coaches because I've had some really amazing coaches. Nice. Would you say like, it sounds like he, he really helped you get that concept, like sort of like the environmental thing, helping to put, push your skiing. Did any of the other coaches, like, can you think of anything else? Like, even if it was like a different aspect, like, Hey man, like stop eating the popcorn, stop playing video games, like get sleep. Like, would you say there's things that other coaches instilled in you? I mean, there's a guy, Worm, Jeremy Transu um, at JMVS, who like a really undervalued um, aspect of coaching is just like caring for your athletes. And so this guy would um, see me struggling in the course and he'd take me aside and go, we're going free skiing. The course isn't productive for you. Tell me what's going on. Why are you frustrated? Start from the ground up. Let's do this. And like just having like someone do that was like was amazing and 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 saved me from going into a funk every once in a while and that was that was big yeah that's that's really important isn't it because those funks are sometimes hard to get out of oh yeah right like so yeah okay cool cool hey on to like equipment do you do much so you're given your new ski boots this season what if what do you do do you do you do much to get them dialed in? Ski boots are always uh, just a, a fascinating thing to think about for me. And I, and I try not to think about them too much. Um, I think having confidence in your setup is like, it, I think it's, you can't win if you don't have confidence in your setup. So um, that, um, hmm, trying to figure out what exactly to say, because yeah, ski boots get complicated. Basically, you know, I always skied in the same boots. And then on my first couple of years with the D team, they were like, Hey, you know, an important part of being a ski racer is figuring out and tuning your setup. And so we're going to do some canting. We're going to see what, you know, angle we should tilt your boots in or out. We got to figure out what angle to tilt the cuffs of your boots in or out. Um, We got to figure out the ramp angle, like how far your boots are tilted forward or back on the skis. And um, it's a it's a skill being able to test because there's so many variables in skiing and you can free ski on a pair of skis that feels awesome and then you'll go in the course and it still feels awesome maybe but uh, you're a second slower than you were on your other setup so there's like there's it's subjective but also you try to like time so that it's objective and like you can get caught in these vortexes of of you know testing stuff um, ultimately I came to a point where I was just like, not going to think about it anymore. I'm just going to ski on this pair of boots. If I need a little bit more grip, I'll put the boots, I'll tilt them out half a degree. If you tilt the boots out, it makes them more aggressive. It takes less, you know, knee angle for the ski to arc. Um, and sometimes it means I have more grip on ice. Um, so I've just settled on my boot setup and I, I, uh, to continue that confidence, I tested one thing I was thinking about. I was like, Hey, maybe this would work. I tested it this summer. It was a disaster. And so I was like, okay, what was it? What did you test? Did you test in? Um, no, I tested, huh? um, I put my, I put the bottom of the boots, tilted it back in and then canceled that out by tilting my cuffs out. Out. Yeah. Okay. And what did you huh. feel? Um, I'll ask you first, what was the, what was the theory? And then what was the actual result? The theory was like, in general, I'm a little knock kneed. Um, And so we could get into a whole thing about people's bodies and who's built best for skiing. But some, there's a theory out there that people built best for skiing are those people that kind of have those bent tibias where if you see someone's leg, like bowed. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. Like the knees, they're not like, like a cowboy, but their lower leg is curved outwards exactly. like you can fit your fist between their calf muscles when their feet are together almost yes exactly yeah. if, if they're too bowed it's it's a nightmare bow the right amount like you see a lot of skiers will have that kind of like bow to their legs um so my and the way just my hips and, and legs work like my knees end up a little bit more knock need especially when i'm skiing when i'm not skiing that well my, my knees are kind of together and so i was like hey maybe i can artificially pull those knees out a bit by tilting the cuffs out um, that will make it more aggressive to counteract that. I'll, I'll put the bottom of the boot in a bit. And it just, it just, it just felt wrong. Like it just felt like my knee wasn't lining up with the boot the way I wanted it to. Um, I was way slower on the flats. I felt like there was something there on the steeps, but 
it was really inconsistent. So I, I kicked it to the curb. Yeah. Okay. So what do you run now? Do you go a little bit out um, in the, in the canting run, on the um, sole? Yeah, I, I smidge out and run half a degree out at the bottom and that's it. Have you got to do much internally to like get it a nice fit? And... Um, I've got a, a really nice, um, footbed shout out matt schiller that i've been using for ages and that thing is nice it's nice to have a little arch support um i was thinking about trying some foam liners i've heard those are cool to kind of keep the foot um tighter in the boot um and just have a little more control but i haven't tried that yet yeah but you don't need to like do massive grinding or punching no i mean i've got bone spurs like anyone else so they'll we'll grind out the, my heels and we'll grind out my six toe. And that's kind of it. Yeah. Cool. I don't actually awesome. Six toe, just what they call the. You know, yeah. The you know, I know. Yeah. Yeah. That boat on, on the side. Yeah. I think if you're not getting that, that's this, you're not skiing hard enough <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> on skis. Like you, so if we stick with equipment stuff, you're mentioning there's quite a nuance like to, to speed skiing. Um, so like then getting on skis that are built like super G downhill, downhill style yeah what's what you you you're telling me a little bit about that when um like getting that right and how there's lots of stuff to play with do you want to do you want to talk to that um no it's it's really fun to like if you just go into um you know i was at copper mountain training and almost every speed team in the world um for a good week or so before the lake louise world cup is all training at copper and so the the copper east village lodge is completely taken over um, by ski racers, um, you know, rented out and the whole bottom floor is just the, the ski technician ski rooms. Um, and there's just lines and lines of skis in these rooms. Um, you know, each speed skier probably comes to Colorado with like, um, I don't know, like 20 pairs of speed skis or something like that. Wow. And they're all, you know, some of them are different skis and that they turn differently. Um, and some of them are different skis and that th- their base grind is different or the base material is different. And so they've got different base grinds for, you know, wet snow will be a deeper base grind and dry snow will, you know, be shallower. They'll have, um, you know, different base materials that work on cold snow and, um, warm snow. And so their job is to kind of figure out what ski they like. Um, but a lot of these speed skiers will have like, a ski that they're like, this is my Bormio ski. And it feels awesome at Bormio, but it doesn't feel good anywhere else. Um, And so there's this, like I was talking about earlier, like there's so many like objective ways, but also subjective ways to test this stuff. And it's, and it starts to get like, it's almost um, mystical at a certain point, you know, cause you go in to these rooms and you'll talk to these technicians and some of them will say the key to a fast speed ski is waxing it with the correct wax for the Bormio race six months ahead of time. So in June, I'm waxing this ski HF, like whatever, HF, whatever, whatever, you know, temperature and yeah. sit. And if the wax just sits and then other guys will t- tell you, Hey, like there's no such thing as wax sinking into a ski. Once it's on a ski, that's it. And, and it's really fun to talk to these guys because they're like, some guys will do a million wax cycles. Some guys will do a million you know, cycles where they ski to ski in on the snow. Um, so yeah, what you said, there's no like set science. Like they know, Hey, do this with this amount of time. And, uh, and that produces a fast ski. It's, it's not like that at all. So there's not set science, which I think is, is hilarious. Um, like they, they've done enough testing that they know like, okay, this base material, this grind or this wax is fast. Um, but I just feel like there's no way to really test the like, letting a ski sit or not letting a ski sit or all this different stuff. Or like some people will say once the ski is HF six, then it stays HF six. And no matter what you do, it's always going to be a base of that. And some guys will say it doesn't matter. Um, Some guys will even say the temperature, the wax temperature doesn't matter at all. Like I've heard, I've heard guys tell stories of like, you know, they had one pair of skis that was fast and it was fast everywhere. You could wax it with, your grandmother's wax in the basement and it was going to be fast. And, and this is like hung on to that ski. one of the best in the world kind of like, or like yeah. that level. Like this is a ski that like wins world cups. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Just put candle wax on it and it still yeah, like, rips. 
Yeah, that's cool. That's fascinating, isn't it? Um, but you're you you're more slalom specific, is that right? Like that's what you're. Is that correct to oh, say that? Yes. Yeah. You know, I I I was actually um, in the running for maybe starting Super G World Cups. I had a couple of really good Super G races, um, and um, ever since I broke my leg skiing Super G, just haven't skied at a high level since. I was asking you before, like changing uh, tact here a bit. Like, can you ski moguls? Yeah. Okay. Um, Is that partly to do with where you grew up skiing? Partly. I mean, I like the, in Vermont, I think there's a rich culture of mogul skiing. You know, you've got a lot of these small ski areas like Mad River Glen and Mad River will, um, will groom like one or two trails and the rest is just, you know, natural snow. And so it's all moguls. Um, and my dad, was a big fan of like Wayne Wong growing up. And he was like, but he was like so stoked on moguls. And so naturally I was stoked on moguls. Um, and I would just um, straight line them as fast as I could. And, um, you know, I have a ball doing it. And I think it's great for your slalom skiing. Yeah. Do you, so do you still ski moguls like from time to time? Yeah. From time to time. Good for the soul. Like I, I remember last having a tough series and, the series was over and I just went out and ripped some moguls and um, it was just, just a blast. Have, have you ever skied like proper mogul skis in the moguls? I haven't. No. What do you usually ski a slalom ski or like a free ride sort of ski in Whatever the moguls? I've got free ride skis on your feet. Slalom ski GS skis are fun. Cause I feel like I'm, you know, I got the one ninety fives on. It feels like I'm throwing it back to the old days. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just think it's interesting on that. I've had one pair ages ago, these like Rosignol mogul specific skis. And it was amazing the difference. Uh, like it makes it much easier to ski like zipper line moguls and way more fun. Um, Cause a lot of the time, like I'm skiing on a slalom ski for, for demonstrating as a coach and stuff. And those things like just the wide tip and tail, like they're always trying to overturn you. And so yeah. it does force like a slightly different, style and it feels like it's much nicer to ski it on a gs ski because you're not getting that tip pulling as much and, and the tip also hits the bump earlier and kind of like so so you can really be forward yeah. and, and you get absorption through the through the tip of the ski um yeah because i saw a guy the other day on instagram who's a really good mogul skier always skis on mogul skis and then he was like oh this is me skiing moguls a zipper line on a on a slalom ski and you could see he had to like even he had to a a adapt differently and was uh was different on it but anyway it's it's fun to to try a real mogul ski in in the bumps you'll have to give it a shot yeah i should i should try it out sometime i should connect with one of the there's a couple national teamers who are from vale so i should connect with them so where are you where are you right now and what's coming up in your um in your schedule so i'm in vale right now <laughs> my parents both live in vale um, so it's, it's, it's nice. I'm here for the next three weeks and we get to stay at home and hang out with my little brother, um, little brothers, actually both are one of them's home from college now. Um, but I'm here training at wherever I get training. So copper Vale, or Beaver Creek, um, potentially going to race a Noram super G at copper. Um, I would be on the 10th and then, um, Beaver Creek Noram tech series, which is the 12th to the 15th of December. And that's kind of like, I'm going for the title this year in Norams, just trying to win Norams. And that's, so that's the start of the season for me. And how many races does that include? So if you get that, what's, um, yeah. How many more races would you need to do to like be in the running to, to win it? There's eight slaloms, eight GSs. Is that right? Yeah. Eight slaloms, eight GSs. Um, it finishes at Whistler in the end of March. Um, and I don't know. It depends from year to year. Like sometimes a ton of world cup guys will ski Norams, but then they'll maybe do one series. And so they'll dilute the points. So then it won't take as many Noram points to win a title. Or sometimes it's just the same group of guys skiing all the Norams. And so you've got to beat everyone every day kind of thing. Um, it kind of depends year to year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the, fin and the last race is when? Uh, Whistler, Mar end of March. In a match, okay, yeah, all right. Well, I look forward to that that moment. I'm sure you'll make a if if you you got to check out Jimmy's Instagram. 
uh, and and please keep making those funny funny edits. He does good, he, you know. Takes the piss out of himself at times on on how the how the season's going. So yeah, hopefully there'll be a good a good one if you claim that title. Yeah. <laughs> you guys, yeah, stay tuned. Follow me. Have you got time for a couple more questions? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I've yeah. got probably twenty more minutes. Yeah. Perfect. Well, I, I one thing that intrigued me, you were like, there's talk of like the perfect built ski racer, like what their anatomy is like, correct? So is that that's something like people start discussing when you're at, at your level? Can you give us a bit of insight? Like you talked about the kind of the bowed tibias. Yeah. Is there any other um, things? And and then and then why would that be an advantage? Um the bowed tibias are kind of an advantage because it it just seems like they allow people to have like you watch someone with really nice matched up knees in their turns um and it just seems like those are the people um and it seems like they have more leverage too with those with those bowed tibias um it's it's a really out there theory but we love talking about it and and this coach i had this this great coach had sasha rerick he'll talk about it from time to time um so that's important but it's not I think the fun thing about ski racing is that there is no body type that is in, well, I'll, I'll rephrase that, rephrase that statement. There's a huge range of body types that can win a world cup where you see Ramon Zenhauser and who's six, seven, which I think is probably the upper limit. Like I, I can't imagine Kevin Durant skiing partly because not many seven foot people ski. So they don't know how to create, um, equipment for a seven foot skier. Um, you know, someone who's five foot, nothing is not going to win a men's world cup just because I don't think they have enough mass on them. Um, but you see, um, what's the Bulgarian guy's name? Um, the super short guy. I mean, he's like five, I want to say he's like five, six, he's tiny. And I could see him winning a world cup. That's this huge range of bodies the, the, what it comes down to when you look at bodies is, um, the way you have to ski a course with your body type. So, you know, that Bulgarian guy, um, he's skiing slalom like it's GS. He's making these beautiful arc to arc turns. He has to go arc to arc because he doesn't have the mass or the leverage to not do that. Um, whereas Ramon Zenhauser, and basically he just has to somehow keep all his body parts together. And because his legs are so long, and he, he has so much leverage on the ski that he needs very little edge angle to bend the ski. So he's kind of just sitting there, um, pushing it down the fall line, just trying to keep it all together. Um, yeah. Have, have you, uh, like, have you seen him ski live? Um, uh, yes, I have. Yeah. Is, and it's like really probably quite different to it's, watch, like, like what you're explaining there. Yeah, no, it's, it's crazy. And I like, it's amazing. You can just see the mass. Like it's just like how many kilos or pounds he is, but he's huge. You can, you can just feel that energy moving down the mountain. And when he hits the slalom gates, it's a, it's a thud. It's, you know, he's putting <laughs> some energy behind it. Yeah. Who's, who's your pick for like, uh, the, like the overall champion in slalom this year? Who do you think's, who do you think's, um, and GS, let's say those two. Who who are you putting? Yeah, I just like to put a couple guys in the running. I think it's really hard to just pick one. I think Henrik Kristofferson's always in the running, just because he's such a competitor. I don't think he's necessarily the best slalom skier in the world, but he's a maniacal competitor, um, and he puts it down on race day. Um, I I just don't know if Clement Noel like he just seems like he hasn't trended in the right direction. I see him winning some World Cups. I don't know if I see him winning the title. He's not super adaptable when it gets bumpy. Um, but when he's, when it's, I mean, he won the, he won the gold medal. Like when it's, when it's smooth, he just puts his feet together and, and cuts off so much line. Um, Lucas Broughton, I saw him training in New Zealand and I saw him training somewhere else. And it was like, he, 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 in New Zealand, he was working, he was going really slowly. He was using, he was kind of, um, you could tell he was working on stuff. He wasn't trying to go fast, um, but he was kind of, um, he was, you could see he was exaggerating a movement. He was really trying to keep a tall hip and like stand really tall. 
Um, and it looked like it could be pretty deadly slalom skiing. So <clears throat> I think he'll be in the running. And I think Otley McGrath will be in the running. I did a great podcast with him recently. I'm going to release it soon. Um, he's just got a good attitude too. Like he loves to go fast um, and has fun going fast. And, mm-hmm. and it seems like he carries a bit less pressure on him than some of these European guys that, that, um, you know, just get really intense and, and forget to have a little fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a really good point. And I probably said it before, but I really enjoyed the podcast that uh, Sam and I did with one of the ex Norwegian world cup coaches and just to hear about the culture in Norway. And that's the thing. It just sounds like, man, like if I was on a team, I it sounds like a really cool team to be on. They all, yeah, have a great attitude. Um, yeah, and then you yeah. saying, yeah, like they do like Lucas Bratton starting his own like fashion labels. Like the dude is, <laughs> is like, he's going places, you know, like, he's he's motivated okay cool and what about in gs who do you who you uh gs oh i i just think marco odermatt is head and shoulders above everyone else right now i don't see anyone coming close to him um i like i love to root like i think my guys tommy ford and river radimus are going to be in there i think they're going to be this possibly could be their best season yet um um they're on the up and coming but i just don't see Sorry, guys. I talk, Marco Urmat's <laughs> just ripping right now. Like, and so is it just in, like, what do you think it is? He's just got a real feel for the, like, taking the line, like, right to the, like, as direct, but still being able to, you know, yeah. not scrub speed. And he goes direct, which is like, that was like Bodie Miller's, like, number one thing. He's like, if you're not going straight, you're like, you're not racing or whatever. Like, you got to go straight. So he d- definitely does that. He also just puts so much energy into the ski at the top of the turn. Like you watch him, he he does, sometimes it'll be a double pole plant, but he kind of throws his body over the tip of his skis at the top of the turn. So he like, you know, like I was talking about earlier, like, you know, he, he establishes that, that turn a little bit earlier than some people. And not only is he establishing it, um, early but he but his so much weight is forward on his skis that it's just accelerating him into the fall line um that that reminds me you know uh the solden race there was this clip so they come out of the start and it's kind of fairly flat and then there's the first like bit of a roller and the camera is kind of like 45 degrees looking at it i just remember seeing him and he came through the frame of the camera just visibly faster like on that section than everyone else. Everyone else was like just carrying the speed. He looked like somehow he created speed through that. Yeah. So that's what you're talking about. And yeah. So keep the straight leg. I think people, people don't realize the importance of a straight leg, but the physics of it is basically if you're, if your leg is almost locked out, then every ounce of, um, you know, energy that's going into whatever your body or the ski it, it, it's just completely translating. Whereas if you're like, yeah, it's bend, not going into the bending kind of motion. And okay. That's interesting. I haven't thought about that with him. He just more times, like if you took proof every turn, he's got a straighter leg at more points of that, of that turn to kind of just keep his mass being directed around, around the arc. Yeah. yeah that's interesting. Yeah. Make makes physics sense. Totally sweet. I think I've, uh, um, um, there with the questions i've really appreciated your your time jimmy i think there's been some really cool stuff we've talked about if you want to do a little plug for yourself like how can people find out about you and i reached out to you because i know you were, you were saying you know i'm on the us ski team but i'm unfunded i need some help so if people are listening and they're you know that's something they're interested in doing how how can you how can you sell yourself and how can they find out about you more um yeah i appreciate the the space for the plug um yeah if you i mean the best place to follow me is on instagram at jimmy underscore who underscore um i I post kind of silly videos that i make um and i have i have some fun on there and i'll you know i'll I'll post my race results when when those come through um i just want you to stay tuned um oh also listen to the listen to the podcast our arc city uh anywhere you find your podcasts and uh, i've got i've got some you know, mostly just World Cup skiers on there. Um, but um, 
yeah, uh, check it out. Um, and then just stay tuned. Cause I'm, I'm working on a few things. Um, I've got a head sponsor. I think it seems very promising and I'll probably announce that in January. Um, but I, you know, I'm always looking for support and I'm always like, you know, kind of hustling. So I'm, I think I'm going to come out with a, with like some apparel for arc city for the podcast and, and then maybe some personal apparel that you can buy and all those proceeds, um, benefit me and help me fund my season because yeah, I'm, I'm training with this us ski team all year, but I've got no funding. So I'm paying for all the travel, all the lodging, you know, all the food, all the lane fees, the rental cars, all that stuff. So it, it adds up a lot. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that was one thing I was going to ask you before we go, what have you learned from doing your own podcast? Oh yeah. Um, so much. It's incredible. You know, it's funny because I had this one coach, incredible coach, by the way. Um, but he hated the podcast for a little while. He like truly, truly, he's like, this is, um, a distraction from skiing. And I don't want you to be a journalist asking world cup skiers about them. I want you to be beating them. And I think this puts you in a mindset where you're, you're thinking they're a level above you. So it was an interesting, you know, interesting perspective. Um, I didn't believe it. Um, and, and I think he's come around to it. You're secretly, you're secretly like learning, undermining them, like playing the like friendly. Yeah. Hey, yeah. And then you're like, grab that idea, grab that idea. Exactly. And like, yeah. Exactly. yeah. I mean, I was, I was, I was telling you, I have a, I have a secret about boots that I'm not going to tell anyone in this. Podcast That's it. Because no, nope. I told you, so you've got the yep. secret info, but I can't divulge that information yet. Cause it feels like, um, an advantage to me right now. Um, but um, yeah, I, I like, you know, it's amazing. I get to talk to these people that win world cups and, and do it at the highest level, like Darren Ralves and, and Lindsey Vaughn and Michaela. And, and there's so much to be learned. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you all of it. Um, one thing that really stuck with me was, was when I talked to Darren Ralves, this was back when I worked for ski racing media. Um, we did, a I used to do their podcast for them. And I talked to Darren Ralves and he said one of his pre-race rituals was watching not ski racing, but big backcountry jumps, um, motocross and uh, surfing. And just like these, these three sports outside of ski racing that he loved to do. And he would watch that and just get stoked about like expressing himself about like finding that flow of moving down a wave or down dirt or down a mountain in like a fun way where you're just sending it and he would center that feeling. And then that would, you'd go to sleep with that and he'd race with that the next day. And that resonated with me so much. Um, and I, you know, those are three sports that I also partake in. And so that was kind of something I incorporated into my ritual because it just made a lot of sense. And, and that was just something that I would never, ever hear about unless I'd talked to Darren. Yeah. I love that. Because the last guy I interviewed, he's a, a surf coach, uh -huh. and um, and I like you. I love surfing, but I'm nowhere near as good at surfing as I am skiing, so I'm still learning it. But the things I've learned from surfing, I love trying to apply in in from surfing to skiing. Like I love in surfing how much expression there is, and 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 that's the stuff. And I think yeah. you know sometimes I just. Yeah, that's cool about big mountain skiing when they like you should really surf and, and ride the mountain. So I'm trying to take some of those feelings of like where there's pressure and where there's no pressure and where there's yeah, other things going on and and, and having that that just yeah, like you said, you, there's this feeling that builds up inside you that you know and it and it puts you in that flow state where you really, you know, let more autopilot run. And we all run better if you've done the training on autopilot, you know? Oh, yeah. That's nothing true. What he said. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Jimmy, thanks so much for your time. Uh, best of luck. I'll, I'll speak to you again when you are NORAM champion and yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thanks for your time. Yeah. Thank you.